The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. It may be that the rituals that human beings have evolved from animal rituals. But there's a catch here, because what are animal rituals? Basically, all animal rituals are mating rituals. So the connection between sexuality and all of the rituals that we have as human beings, including the spiritual rituals, seems to be deeply based on millions of years of evolution. Hey everyone, it's Tuesday. I'm your host, Michael Kavnat, and this is the Next Big Idea Daily. Today, let's talk about sex, baby. Specifically, let's talk about sex and religion. Now, you may not think these topics have anything to do with one another. In fact, we tend to think of the sexual and the spiritual as two very different human instincts, even opposite human instincts. But in fact, they might be deeply connected, according to Andrew Newberg, author of the new book, Sex, God, and the Brain, How Sexual Pleasure Gave Birth to Religion and a Whole Lot More. Andrew is a medical doctor and director of research at the Marcus Institute of Integrative Health at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, where he also teaches emergency medicine and radiology. Here he is to share some of his big ideas. This is Dr. Andrew Newberg. I'm going to give you five of the basic questions that I am addressing in the book, Sex, God, and the Brain. The first question is, why do we think spirituality and sexuality are linked in the first place? And for this question, I want to start by answering it from the religious perspective. If you look into the Bible, think about what happens when humanity is first created by God. In fact, what it says in the book of Genesis is that as soon as man is created by God, God blesses human beings and says one thing to them. God says, be fruitful and multiply. Before God says, believe in me, before God says, engage in religion, God tells human beings to be fruitful and to multiply. And how do we do that? We do that through sexuality. It is a creative process. And in fact, if you go back to the very first line in the Bible, what does God do before anything else? God creates the heaven and the earth. God is the creative force in the context of religion that creates everything around us. So whether you believe in God or not, what is fundamental for you to understand is that the concept of creation and the ability to create lies at the heart of virtually every spiritual tradition. Is actually the same as the first question. Why do we think spirituality and sexuality are linked? But this time I want to answer it from a biological perspective, a neuroscientific perspective. As I mentioned in my introduction, I have spent many years studying religious and spiritual practices and experiences. And we have observed all kinds of changes going on in the brain, depending on what people are doing and what they are experiencing. To some degree, one of the important points that I have come to realize is that there is not just one part of our brain that is the spiritual part. There's not one part of our brain when you walk into a church, a mosque, or a synagogue, or begin to meditate. Many different parts of the brain become involved. And for anyone who does have a spiritual life, I think they would understand that because when you realize the richness and diversity of all the different kinds of spiritual practices, rituals, and experiences, you really think that it has to engage lots of different parts of the brain. So for example, if you're thinking about God or the nature of the universe, you might use the cognitive parts of your brain. If you're feeling a sense of awe or love, you might use the emotional centers of your brain. And if you see an image or feel something profound going on inside your body, these are the sensory areas of your brain. All of these can become involved when we are engaged in these kinds of practices and experiences. 
And one of the most interesting changes that we have observed over the years is a change in what's called the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is what basically connects our brain to our body. And it allows us to feel either feelings of arousal and energy or feelings of calmness and blissfulness. When people engage in religious and spiritual practices, they can have either one of those kinds of experiences. Sometimes a meditation practice can help make you feel deeply blissful, and sometimes a very energetic spiritual practice can make you feel aroused and alert and very excited. What's particularly fascinating about the autonomic nervous system is that while it has this arousal and quiescent mechanism to itself, it also happens to be highly active when we're engaged in sexual activity. In fact, both parts, the arousal and the calming parts of the autonomic nervous system are absolutely necessary for us to have sex at all and to have a feeling of orgasm and ecstasy. So when we look at all of these changes, we can see how powerful it is that sexuality and spirituality are deeply linked in the brain. The third question I want to address is how did this connection between sexuality and spirituality arise in the first place? Well, to some degree, this goes back to my relationship with a mentor that I met long ago when I was in medical school. He used to have these incredible dinner parties where I, as a very young and bright-eyed medical student, would be sitting around the table with luminaries of the medical world. Many of them had won Nobel Prizes or developed entire new areas of research in the world of psychology or in brain physiology. It was an incredible experience, but what we frequently talked about were religious and spiritual practices and particularly various rituals. In fact, all of the dinner parties that I participated in were loaded with rituals because he understood the value that rituals have in our lives. If you think about your own life, you have many rituals that can include religious and spiritual rituals. It could include cooking rituals, waking up in the morning rituals, job rituals. These are different practices and different things that we do in a rhythmic kind of way all the time that help ground us and make us feel connected to ourselves and to whatever it is that we feel connected to. But where do the rituals come from? Well, if the rituals are part of the human brain, then perhaps they evolved in our brain through animal rituals. In fact, my late colleague was not only a psychiatrist by training, but had a PhD in anthropology. So he was always looking at the evolutionary perspective when it came to our understanding of the brain and our spiritual selves. So he postulated that it may be that the rituals that human beings have evolved from animal rituals. But there's a catch here, because what are animal rituals? Basically, all animal rituals are mating rituals. So the connection between sexuality and all of the rituals that we have as human beings, including the spiritual rituals, seems to be deeply based on millions of years of evolution. What do the animal mating rituals do? They connect us to ourselves and most importantly, to another so that we can have a very profound experience that leads to procreation of the next generation of our species. And to some degree, this is exactly what happens when we engage in a religious or spiritual ritual. We connect with others, we feel a sense of ecstasy, and it leads to the next generation of people who believe in the tradition that we are following. The next question I address in Sex, God, and the Brain is how can we find neuroscientific evidence for this relationship between sexuality and spirituality? Over the past 30 years, as I've mentioned, I've had the great fortune to be able to study all types of spiritual practices from all of the major traditions. I have studied practices in Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. I have even studied practices such as speaking in tongues and Brazilian mediums entering into a trance state as they connect to the spirit of the dead. 
But none of these studies actually help us to understand the relationship between sexuality and spirituality. This had to wait until my most recent study that I was able to perform that looked at a very unique and unusual practice called orgasmic meditation. The reason that orgasmic meditation is a unique and unusual practice is that it is a paired practice. So there are two individuals involved and the focus of the practice is actually sexual stimulation. In our study, men stimulated the clitoris of a female participant. But interestingly, in this practice, both individuals are considered to be taking part in the practice. Both of them are focusing on this form of sexual stimulation. Now, you might be thinking that this does sound like a pretty weird kind of practice. But interestingly, if you think about other meditation practices, many are focused on physiological processes. Many meditation practices focus on the breath and breathing. They might focus on walking and paying attention to what happens when you're walking. Or you might repeat a mantra by saying certain phrases over and over again. So there are many physiological processes that can become the focus of meditation. And in this case, we are talking about sexual processes and sexual stimulation. When we looked at the brain scans of people who were engaged in this practice, we found some fascinating changes in both of the men who were giving the stimulation as well as the women. On one hand, we did see some evidence of sexual arousal and sexual stimulation. Areas of the brain involved in sensory processing and even sexual arousal seem to get involved in the process. But far more important is the fact that when people were engaged in this practice, we generally were seeing all kinds of changes going on in the higher areas of the brain that are involved in our sense of self, our sense of connection to others, our social interactions with each other, and profound feelings of awe and powerful emotions and energy feelings. So for the people who are engaged in this practice, it was far more a spiritual practice than it ever was a sexual one. And this helps us to understand the relationship between sexuality and spirituality. In fact, there are many individuals throughout many different cultures in the world who actually use the energy from sexual stimulation to help induce spiritual experiences. The last question that I'm going to talk about is, what is neurotheology anyway, and how does it relate to this connection between sexuality and spirituality? Well, neurotheology is the field of study, the field of scholarship that helps us to understand the relationship between our brain and our spiritual selves. There's a couple of important points about neurotheology. One is that it is not just a neuroscientific evaluation of spirituality, nor is it a kind of theological or spiritual perspective on science. It is really looking at both sides, both the neuro side and the theology side to help us understand who we are as human beings. So when it comes to studying the relationship between sexuality and spirituality, neurotheology can take us all the way back hundreds of thousands of years where some of the first figurines and first images of anything spiritual were actually fertility gods and ideas about spirituality that were based on creation and the propagation of our species. Sexuality and spirituality have actually been deeply embedded with each other since the beginning. And perhaps that shouldn't be a surprise to us because Sexuality and spirituality are perhaps two of the most important aspects of human life and human behaviors that has existed since the beginning of humanity. But neurotheology also asks us to look beyond just the evolutionary background. But what does all of this mean from the perspective of who we are as human beings, our psychology, our morality, and ultimately our biology? How do we look at this relationship between sexuality and spirituality when it comes to moral development, spiritual development, and also when things happen to go awry? After all, both sexuality and spirituality, while they can be wonderful, can also go in very bad directions, leading to things such as abuse, rape, and violence. 
The only way we are going to ever be able to understand both the positive as well as the negative consequences of sexuality and spirituality is by studying them and by looking at how they are deeply connected to each other and deeply connected to our brain and our biology. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, listeners, if you got something out of this and you want to see more of what we have to offer, sign up for one of our newsletters using the links in the episode notes. Or go to nextbigideaclub.com to find out about our curated box subscription service. We'll send you the best new nonfiction books right to your door as selected by our curators, Malcolm Gladwell, Adam Grant, Susan Kane, and Daniel Pink. That's nextbigideaclub.com and use the code DAILY for a special discount. I'm Michael Kovnett. See you tomorrow.